all CEOs, me included, we don't actually know what we're doing. They're all sharks, so all you got to do, though, is no shark bait. I don't think we've ever talked about this before. <laughs> we can capture all of the wallet share. First place you start is with the product. That's just the first nut. This is the Capital Stack. Hey, everybody, this is David Paul, the host of the Capital Stack podcast, where I talk to founders, entrepreneurs, and investors about all things value creation in startups. And today I am having a guest who has worked with big companies, has worked with growing companies, has worked with turnarounds, uh, John Lott, who is now the CEO and executive director of Predicate Wealth Managers. John, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. As as I told you before, I'm trying to digest like a sandwich that I ate in, at an unhealthy speed. Um, you gotta be, you gotta be careful with that. That's, you I, know, <laughs> you gotta create issues for yourself. I got a lot of problems, John. I've got yeah. a lot of problems. So let's see, like, I, let's start. I, I want to talk about young John, the accountant first. And yeah, uh, the, the bean counter. It was a fake accountant, actually, okay. to be right. to be even more precise. All right, let's go. So, so I, I started my career actually in the in the mortgage banking world. Uh, I worked for a company called PHH many many years ago. Uh, they were the second largest independent uh, mortgage originator uh, behind Countrywide prior to the financial crisis, and uh, I worked there for the first thirteen years of my career. And from there, um, I went and uh, I, so that was basically I started buying mortgage back servicing rights. I did everything in the mortgage world. Uh, I did that uh, for, for a very long time, probably too long, to be perfectly candid. Uh, but I learned some amazing skills. I learned how to be a true operator of a business. And uh, those were some of the best skills that I ever learned. Uh, I, I believe that it's actually easier to teach someone to become a finance person than it is to teach someone how to become an operator. Uh, the operating side is much more difficult. Um, people tend to pay more for the finance side, but the, the operating skills are truly, truly worth their weight in gold if you have them. And if you were to surmise those skills on, a, on, on one hand, what would those skills be? So, and this actually kind of feeds well into the, the accounting thing. I think if I were to put you know a tagline or one liner, it's I learned how to link the operating activities of the business to the financial sheet, the financial balance, whether it's the balance sheet or the income statement or the cash flow statement. Uh, I learned how to link those things in a really unique way. And if you can early in your career figure out how to take the operating uh, activities of a business doesn't matter what kind of business it is, and link those to the financial activities of the business. Now you now you got something. Uh, so th that's the way I would I would describe it. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. No. Absolutely. And <clears throat> I, I do agree with that. I mean, there's a gazillion David Pauls out there. You know, um, I always think that <laughs> I find that uh, I've had this epiphany uh, lately that like capitalism's been solved and all of us money guys are making rich guys richer and we're all fighting for the same pie. And there's not a lot of innovation within that. No, I, I agree. Like, look, there are some really talented finance guys. I've worked with some, I spent a lot of time in New York, uh, which we'll get to that. But, um, you, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're either providing financing to a business, right? or you're providing financing to a project or some asset class. Um, and to your point, most of those things have been solved. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, uh, and so it's interesting to think that, you know, mortgage backed securities in the eighties wasn't really a thing. It was mm -hmm. just starting to become a thing. Um, and now the closest thing we have to that is, um, digital currencies, right? And uh, blockchain. And what is that going to become? And to me, I've spent the last two years really digging deep into that space. And it's, it's unclear what's going to come from that. Um, what I can tell you is there, there's not a lot of assets out there in the digital space 
that have true cash flow characteristics that you can model like you could in the securitization. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly rare that you get a new category. And as a result, uh, to your point, most of the stuff's been solved. We know how to do private equity. We know how to do leverage finance. We know how to do restructurings. Uh, there's a whole body of law and uh, case studies, and right? So there's not a lot of uncharted territories. Starting new companies is a little different. Yeah, no, and <clears throat> I feel like you're right. It's like everyone talks about crypto and um, like Dogecoin doesn't have any value today right but doesn't mean it's not going to have value in the future and it is it is it's a it's a it's a platform shift into something new um that at least is different um do you do you believe that the private equity market is is efficient to the t no um so i think that the private equity market here, here's my observation as someone who is both i've actually had three different roles one is as a CEO of a private equity run business, I've been a board member and a restructuring executive for companies that were blowing up. Um, and then third, uh, I've been an investor in both as an LP and a GP in different private equity investments. And what I will tell you is um, there are great success stories, but there's a lot of not success stories. And typically, it's an issue where the sponsor, the general partner of the private equity firm, and the person who is ultimately responsible for the business do not see eye to eye on what the path forward is. Mm-hmm. And, and that is a very human activity. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we can have differences. We can have arguments about strategy or margins or pricing or any of those things. But in the end, getting on the same page is ultimately a relationship driven activity. And sometimes people just don't like each other um, or they don't see eye to eye or they have um, very uh, different views of how life is supposed to work. That, that to me, is where all the challenges really come in. Um, and, you know, I've been a part of more restructurings than I, I care to mention. And it, it's almost always a, it's a loss of faith, <laughs> be, right, between the sponsor and the, and the management team. And, no and one, almost always the CEO. No, no one's happy, right? Like, no, no one wins in that scenario. No. Nope. Um, it's just like, and the other ones think everyone thinks the other person's benefiting, but it's, it's really, well, they think the other person's an idiot. Right. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, I feel, especially on the earlier stage when you have locking horns, I call it between investors and founders, like you might as well just throw in the towel. Like it's just, it's just like the companies aren't even scaled enough to, to, to handle that kind of, uh, trauma. Correct. It's, it's very difficult to overcome that. And like I said, it's a very human skill. Uh, so actually, if depending on which side, because I know your audience, right, is like some of the people are uh, entrepreneurs and they're calling to get the perspective of what the capital providers and then, you know, the other part of your audience are capital providers. Um, if you can do anything, it's learn to see things through the other person's eyes. Mm-hmm. Learn to see it through the, the entrepreneur's eyes. And if you're the entrepreneur, learn to see it through the capital provider's eyes. Uh, that's one of the most valuable things you can do. And it, you, it, you'd be amazed at the difference in an outcome for a company, both as an investor and an entrepreneur, uh, that will make if you can just spend a little bit of time understanding the other person's perspective. I think that's easier i think that's easy like it's it's one of those hand wavy things i find when i lock horns with founders it's like this is my perspective and then you get i hear you but so but it's like so you, you already you basically said yes but there's a preconceived notion in a founder's head that your business model uh, allows for losers. So I don't really <laughs> give a shit right, about your opinion because this is what I'm doing. Right. And you know, yep. that's just, that's just how it is. Like you have to, you have to suck it if, if this becomes a loser. Yeah. Well, I, I actually, it's funny. I just, uh, was part of a, a seminar the other day and one of the women who spoke talked about the word, but, and how you basically should never use the word, but ever again. So basically it's like, I heard everything you just said, 
but it was all stupid. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. right. I heard so what you I'm said, but I don't give a shit. It. Yeah. <laughs> so what she said, which kind of makes sense, she goes, I heard you. And in addition to that, what I would say is we should consider blah, blah, blah. As opposed to going to, but everything you said was completely stupid and we shouldn't really listen to anything you say because you're a moron. Um, so uh, I, I think just using the word and instead of but is one very tactical thing you could implement like now um, to actually just be a better capital participant or entrepreneur recipient of capital. And, and people really just don't understand that these are like partners in your business. Huh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, They're like, stakeholders. You know, There's like, a technical like, term for it. They're it never, stakeholders. It never goes up and to the right completely, like unless you're extremely lucky. And then eventually – Someone's going to call them and say, hey, would you, are you going to put more money in? Or are you going to back this person again? And if you're not like on good terms with them, and if you they feel like you've just been, yeah, butting them for you know a couple of years, dude, you're, you're dead. You better fucking execute correctly. You, you got it right. You, you've painted yourself into a very tight corner. So letting, letting room for compromise by using the and word. Yeah. I think that's a, a, a very specific thing you could walk away from this podcast with and implement like immediately. And so tell me about your transition from doing kind of this restructuring work. And um, well, tell me about Spearmint. Let's talk about Spearmint for a while. You have such a diverse background. Yeah, it's kind of crazy, actually. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, we'll go back to let's we'll go back to the restructuring part. because There's a lot more to that story, sure. okay. um, you know, with Cerberus and everything else, which we can get to. But, you know, as it relates to Spearmint. So in 2013, you know, I, I'll set this up on a human level. So I was working in New York, had been for a decade. Um, I had an apartment in New York City. I had a house in New Jersey and two kids, a dog, a wife. Um, and I had a daughter from a previous marriage. So a total of three kids had a lot of what I would call relationship complexity. And I, uh, would go every Sunday night. I would drive from my house in New Jersey into the city and go to my apartment. Uh, and I would begin work Monday morning and then I would be there until Friday night and I would drive home Friday night. So I basically saw my family for 48 hours highly compressed. And by the time Monday started, I mean, uh, Sunday night started to roll around, I was pretty bumped. So, uh, so my wife basically said, and, uh, my wife, my wife was an exceedingly direct individual. Uh, she said, this is stupid. Um, I can't do this anymore and we have to do something different. So we basically sold all of our shit. Can I say shit? All right. Yeah. All right. I'm going to say shit. All right. So uh, we sold our shit. Um, no plan. And we moved to Arizona and my plan was, I was going to do some, uh, direct investing in private credit type assets and look for a business, uh, to run, turn around, do whatever. And then she, when she moved out here, started the business out of a closet in their house. And that business is Spearman Love. And the very quick, uh, overview on that is it's a business that sells children's clothing. You know, our focus is, you know, we go up to five, seven years, um, but we really are very active in the zero to 24 month category for children's clothing, accessories, etc. And we started with two SKUs out of a closet in their house. And now it's a, a fairly sizable uh, eight figure business uh, that, you know, we control. So we, we bootstrapped it. We still own 100% of the business. Um, we funded the business, uh, the working capital, which is, you know, one of my, I guess if I, if I have a superpower, it's how to use um, working capital to fund the business. You know, because all my banker friends are like, oh, dude, you're going to need a ton of capital to fund this. I'm like, nah, I don't think so. Uh, and so I used... Uh, purchasing cards, and I use the balance sheets of my vendors to finance the business. And so, to this day, we have we have no UCC one on any asset. We have no term debt of any kind. Um, we own 100 percent of the business, and we self funded it. And the initial check, 
the initial equity check for that business was seven thousand dollars. It was the only money I ever put in the company, uh, and to this day, we've never put another dime in, and we've taken out more than eight figures. So, yeah, that's so the that's the that's the story on on Spearman. It's been an amazing ride. If I could replicate that investment over and over again, that would be pretty fun. Uh, but I don't know that I'll ever replicate that one. Yeah, why did, why did it like, yeah, so it's, it's so funny. It's like everyone's like, oh, just do it again, right? Like, what, like <laughs> what, 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 <laughs> it's a very easy thing to say for both founders and investors, right, to underwrite. You know, oh, he's done it before. You just can do it again. What, what made Spearmint work, right, from your perspective that made it, you know, enable to be able to do it again? Did you catch a wave? I mean, I mean it's three things. Right. <laughs> Three things. So one is um, my wife had an existing audience. She was blogging um, before she started the store, and she'd actually built a decent size audience from her blog. She had about 50,000 uniques a month coming to her blog, which in 2013 was pretty decent. That's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, so it was leg- it was a legit blog. And um, so we started with that. And she's like, I don't want to talk about products anymore. I want to sell products. So that was the genesis. The second thing that we got right was a little bit of like just being in the right place at the right time. I was acquiring customers for less than five bucks on Facebook and Instagram back then. Um, second, she, uh, you know, building on that whole Facebook, Instagram thing, we got over 2 million followers on Facebook. We got, a, you know, she's got close to a million followers now on Instagram, millions of email addresses. But that was built really on sub five dollar cost of acquisition Facebook days, which just doesn't exist anymore. That would be almost impossible to bootstrap today. Correct. Uh, you'd have to find another way, and and this is you know this is a core message for me when I'm talking to entrepreneurs or would be entrepreneurs is everyone always starts with a product. But it's actually really the market that you really need to know. How are you going to find customers? How are you going to reach customers? How are you going to convert customers? And how much is that activity going to cost? Mm -hmm. And it's amazing when I talk to people and I put my investor hat on as an entrepreneur, how little most people understand of those activities, right? That they should really understand to the, to the nines, right? Like take it out to the nine decimal places. You should really understand those numbers top to bottom. So, um, and then the third thing, um, that made us successful is my wife really truly is a talented designer. Uh, it just so happens she married a private equity husband. So that combination, and I've heard this said many times and I actually genuinely believe it. I think a lot of successful businesses have a partnership of some sort where there's a visionary head of the business who has a product vision of where they want to go, a brand, uh, an identity, and they have a clear view of where they want to go. And then there's another person who knows how to make the trains run on time. And I'm the trains run on time guy, uh, or have been, and I, I was for Spearman. And my wife did a fantastic job on the product side and turning herself into a personality that people can relate to. So those are the three things we got right, and it mattered a lot. And, you know, honestly, it changed their lives. And it's, is it easy working with your wife? Um, so, yes and no. That's a great question. I actually love that question. Um, so, it was super hard at first. In, in fact, it, it, depending on your tolerance for expletives, I'll tell you the original story. So, I was actually doing advisory work for another brand. Uh, it was a, uh, a consumer product company in Brooklyn. And it was a Sunday afternoon and we were in our house in Paradise Valley. It was a tiny little house when we first moved out here. And I was doing a conference call on a Sunday and I I was like wrapping up this conference call and I could see my wife was pissed. And um, she looked at me after I got off the phone and and, and am I allowed to drop the F-bomb? Of course. Or should I? I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So if I haven't, it's shocking that I haven't even said it yet. Yeah. All right. All right. So she goes to me and this is an exact quote of and the, this was the entire conversation of how I went from not working to my wife's business to how I went for working with my wife's business. She goes, why the fuck are you going to make some other asshole a bunch of money? Why don't you come work with me? Wow. And I said, I responded in my typical East Coast way. I said, because we'll fucking kill each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she goes, well, we just got to get over that. 
Mm-hmm. And I said, because I can't not get the last word because I'm just wired that way. I said, just remember, this was your idea. And that was it. That was the whole conversation. That like 15 minutes later, I was working on the business. That's amazing. It changed our lives. Boom. Now, you ask, this, you ask a slightly different question, which is, what was it like working with your wife? That was the decision to work with her. I thought it was going to be really hard. And the first two years was. It was difficult. But it, I'll give you a preview of where it ended up. It was the best thing we ever did in our lives and in our marriage. And I'll, I'll tell you why, but I'll give you the lead up. So my wife and I had a really difficult time in the first two years figuring out what our swim lanes were. What was I in, in charge of? What was she in charge of? And I'm a real command and control kind of guy. I don't believe there's two CEOs. I don't mm-hmm. believe that, right? Like, I was like, you're the CEO of this business, right? But she had never been the CEO of a business before. And I, I had been the CEO of probably four at that point, right? So, um, so I wanted her to be the CEO of the business. And she, turns, she has turned into an amazing CEO, um, and, but we really struggled over which swim lane and basically where it ended up was she is the front facing part of the business. She is the personality of the business. She is the product visionary of the business and she does everything related to, um, you know, how the business is perceived in the marketplace and the products that it offers and sells, which is super important. My job was to make sure that we had a building to operate in, to make sure that we had capital to buy inventory and that we could hire the right employees and build a team and all those things. And I spent from 2016 to 2020 full time. And when I say full time, I mean, like not like a full time job, full time. I mean, like entrepreneur full time, which means 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for four years. Mm -hmm. Um, And we scaled the crap out of it. We, we really scaled that business. Uh, and this is the life-changing part. When I was a CEO and she was working from home as a blogger, I didn't understand what she did with the kids all day and blogging and how much effort she was putting into it. And she didn't fully understand what I was dealing with, trying to turn a company around or deal with investors or angry bankers or whatever it was. And so we just didn't understand each other. And what happened through that two-year process is we, tr- we built a true respect for each other. I, like, I have a profound respect for my wife and what she does. Uh, and I think she's an, an extraordinary human being. She's like one of the hardest working persons you'll ever meet. Uh, she is truly insightful. And, but she'd be difficult. Uh, and you, you know me well enough to know I can be difficult too. So we had to build this mutual respect for each other, but it changed our marriage. It changed the family life that we have. Uh, and obviously it had a massive impact on our wealth. Um, so, uh, that one fateful discussion that took place in 12 seconds (laughs) changed everything. I love that. What a great story. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I'm pretty happy with it. <laughs> and, so, and so the company, you know, kind of did what it's doing. Um, yeah. You know, definitely needs to be maintained. But, you know, at a situation where like, you know, the, the, every not every company needs to be a billion dollar company. And you yeah. decided you wanted to do predicate. So, yeah, great question, actually. I'll give you the setup there. So as we started to have some success, obviously, the private banking guys start calling on you and say, Hey, you should be on our platform or you should be on this platform. And so there was a guy in town, uh, uh, named Ethan Fry who worked at the time for BMO, uh, their private bank. Uh, and a number of people like within 24 hours, two people said, you guys should meet. So both of us just decided to meet each other. We went to Capitol grill. We had a lunch and, I love uh, Ethan was a great guy, but I have, and we'll get to this, I guess. I, I had some very discreet views on how to manage money and how not to manage money. And uh, when I interviewed wait, wait, people. Wait, wait. To be clear, did you love me after our first lunch? 
Yeah, actually, I did because I okay. like the I, I um, you know we had a mutual introduction with Brian Edwards, right? Who um, who put us together. I like people. I don't like people who tell me the same shit I could hear on CNN or CNBC. Like I like people who say provocative stuff. And I've never had a lunch with you where we didn't cover something that was like I wrote down, like filling up on the salad <laughs> bar, or yeah, right, like, right, like we all you we always walk away from something. That, that's where I want to spend my time. I want to spend my time with people that really make me think, as opposed to I feel like I just check the box on that conversation and it's an hour I'll never get back in my life. Right. All right. Back to Ethan. Yeah, so so I had a great lunch with Ethan. I loved him. He was a great guy. But I said, so this was he pursued me for five years. And the the punchline of the story was I said, I love you, Ethan, but I'm not gonna let BMO manage my money. I don't have anything against BMO. It's just I have very dis- specific views on how to manage my family's wealth that I don't know the vast majority of people have. And here's here's the, the, the punchline of what created what caused me to start predicate. I believe that the twenty five so if you have net worth in the twenty five million, the two hundred and fifty million dollar category, people in that asset class size are actually remarkably underserved. And I'll tell you exactly why. Typically, they're served by either an RIA who has not created a company like you, has not created wealth, and instead they're what I would call a managerial steward of capital. And that's a bad place to be. But on the other side, at 250, you're not big enough for a family office yet because there's real infrastructure in building a proper family office. So my view is, how do we build a truly unique platform for serving people in that 25 million to 250 million dollar bucket? And that was really the genesis of a predicate. So what happened was Ethan had an opportunity. Uh, to participate in a specific investment. and But in order to do that, he couldn't stay at the bank because of regulatory reasons. So he went out and hung out his own shingle and worked on this specific deal. Uh, and that created an opportunity for he and I to start Predicate together, which we did. Uh, so that was, that was the genesis of Predicate. I think partnerships... So many people rush into partnerships that end up in disasters. Like I think people are so impulsive to do that, but I think there's so much opportunity to try before you buy with co-investing and just doing projects together. And people just are just too impulsive for that. I, I agree, and I'll I'll be the first to say that I actually think partnerships are really hard. And and genetically, I'm probably not wired to be a partner necessarily, right? Because I think most entrepreneurs that are successful are super opinionated, right? Um, Really good ones are opinionated, but good listeners. If you can be both opinionated, but also be a good listener, man, that's a recipe for success. Um, So, you know, I think true entrepreneurs have a real hard time being partners. Um, And, you know, and I just happened to find a guy who has a skill set and is just an amazing human being. Uh, and I've, I've been blessed to have him as a partner. Uh, so if you're able to take a guy who is genetically predisposed to not being a partner and be a good partner, like, he, he's really been a fantastic partner. So uh, I'm very blessed in that regard. That's amazing. And so what are you working on now? So um, predicate you know, we've created this registered investment advisor platform and ironically, so what I'm working on is we're actually looking to find a CEO to run and scale predicate. We're going to perhaps raise some money uh, to help with that scaling exercise. And um, I'm going to say something that's going to sound weird for someone who just started an asset management platform. But I'll tell you why in a second. I said to Ethan, I said, you know, at the end of the day, my passion in life, I wasn't put on this earth to make rich guys richer. 
it's just like, I'm good at it, right? I know how to pick good investments. I know how to underwrite. I know how to um, assess risk reasonably well. But I can honestly say it's not something I get excited about and um, and I want to do as a passion. So what I would like to do is find the right person to run Predicate, bring in a capital partner to help us scale the business, stay on the board of directors of Predicate, and put the right CEO and watch the thing grow, um, which leads to what am I passionate about? And so um, um, you got this eight block thing in the background here. So I'm, I'm going to tell a story. I told a story. To my God, mentor. I swear to God, if you don't give me merch when I see you next time, I'm going to lose my shit. I, I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you a shirt. I okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, a t-shirt. Boys, boys medium. Yeah. All right. You got. It. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so, uh, so I told you the story of my mentor and. Um. Actually, did I tell you the story of my mentor? I can't remember. I was thought. I don't think so. No. So, so my mom. Sorry. Here's my very quick family background. Uh, parents were divorced. My dad was an alcoholic. Uh, not in the picture. And I, I learned about this story. Uh, ten years ago, I'm 55. This happened when I was 15. So my mom was. A, a secretary back when they called administrative assistant secretaries mm -hmm. for the president of a printing company. And when I was about 15 years old, she went to him unbeknownst to me and said, Hey, I got this kid. Uh, I think he's motivated and bright, but I have no idea how to guide him. Would you be willing to mentor him? And so again, still, I don't know the backstory, but just kind of out of the blue, this guy, Tom Kochel, who's also here in town, he's now in his 80s, um, starts asking me to come over to his house and help him because he had bought this amazing uh, restoration. It was a three-story Tudor mansion in, on the main line in Haverford, Pennsylvania. He lived like four houses down from the guy who owned the Phillies, and he bought this house, but it needed to be completely gutted and redone. So we started from the bottom of the house and worked all the way to the top and pulled out lath and plaster and cut giant cast iron tubs in half. And that's what I did every weekend for the next couple of years. And, you know, I put a few bucks in my pocket, but what it really did was put the idea of a bigger world out there. And so I walked out of that um, meeting uh, or that interaction, that series of interactions on the weekends thinking that I wanted to become a CEO. And so, you know, long story sh short, I wind up by the time I was, I, I said I wanted to be CEO. Everyone laughed at me. Uh, even in college, everyone laughed at me. And, and by the time I was 35 years old, I was CEO of a $250 million company that was ultimately controlled by Cerberus. Uh, it was the second largest distributor of aftermarket parts for Harley Davidson. At one time, it was publicly traded and was the largest uh, distributor of aftermarket parts. I was the eighth CEO in seven years, and the company was in real trouble. And, uh, and there were some pretty well-known turnaround CEOs that were in that company before me. And I was the first guy who was able to turn around sales and actually get sales growing again. And we saved the company. And I was very proud of that. Um, so that was, you know, kind of the background of my mentorship. So which leads to what am I doing now? So I can't begin to express to you how profoundly Tom Coach will change my life. You know, like I was a lower class, blue collar kid with, you know, a single mom who was a secretary and a, and a vacant father. Whom I love my father. My father just passed away in December and I, I miss him. Um, but, you know, he was an amazing human being, not necessarily a great dad. Just that, that would be the easiest way I would surmise it. I love my dad and I miss him. Uh, I, have, I, don't, I don't have a bad word to say about him, but in terms of being a present father, he was not that. Yeah. Uh, which created a drive in me, which I used as an amazing fuel. 
Uh, so they, now, uh, a, you don't have to pass a test to be a dad. <laughs> like no, anyone could do no, it. <laughs> no, no, you do not. Uh, no, there's no driver's license or anything of the sort. You just, you know, go out there and make one and see what happens. Um, so, so Tom changed my life. And so I, I have this thing called fuels, which we can actually drill into later if you want. But one of the fuels is called honor. And I'm in a phase of my life where I've made uh, a lot of money and I'm very comfortable and my family is set up for now and future generations. Um, And what I want to do is I'm building a method to see if I can take people who truly want to become successful and are willing to do the work. I want to do what Tom did for me at scale. Hmm. Wow. That's my mission. And like that, yeah, can I tell you where to put some money? Yeah, I can do that. But that's not why I want to wake up every morning. I want to take somebody who's sitting in some shitty apartment right now, who's lost all hope, but really has something inside them and they have something burning and some desire. And I want, like, if I meet that person online or in person or whatever, and they really want to put in the work, I want to help them live the path that I lived going from, you know, broke kid, blue collar kid to sitting where I sit now. So how would you, that's what I want to do in my life. How how do you do that? So I built this crazy thing in my twenties called the eight block method. Um, and I'll give it to you in, you know, 10 seconds here. So the beginning, right. Your block one is your health. If your health is great, you never think about it. If your health's not great, it's the only thing you think about. Mm -hmm. So the second thing is relationships, same deal. Uh, So that's block two relationships. If your relationships are good, things are working when they're not, everything else sucks. Mm -hmm. Next is your resources. If you're in debt, right? Nothing, nothing's worse than feeling like you have more money going out than, uh, than you got money coming in and there's no way you got no hope. So 90, 95% of people's problems are in blocks one, two, and three Mm -hmm. health relationships and resources. The ironic thing is the solutions all lay in the next three blocks. So block four is your interest. It's things you're really passionate about. Uh, and so I really encourage people to pursue their interests, even in their darkest hours, because that's part of the way out of whatever mess you're in, if you're in a mess. Mm-hmm. Right. It's also a way that if you feel like you're in a soulless job, you're, you know, even if you're making a million dollars a year, but you're miserable, I know plenty of those guys. Um, it's because you're not focusing on your interests. You're focusing on the money. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the fifth box is, um, your capabilities, from your interests flow your capabilities and your capabilities is what's going to lead to the answer, which is your craft. What was I put on this earth to do? And at this stage of my life, what I was put on this earth to do is help other people figure out what they're supposed to do and how they can turn that into a sustainable and profitable business. That's it. That's my mission. It's my craft. My whole screwed up story that we've touched on pieces of has led me to this, right? And then the last two blocks are rewards, which is how do we inspire ourselves? What do we, you know, if you want a new house or you want a Ferrari or you want a plane or whatever you want, right? What, what things, what rewards? And it could be a trip. It could be a, the ability to take your daughter for scuba lessons. It doesn't matter. You have a, just a reward system for you and others, and the last block eight is where I spend most of my time now, with, which is legacy. Mm-hmm. What do I want to be known for? When I tap out, I just watched my dad die. It was heartbreaking. Uh, and, um, you know, for me, what life is really about is who shows up at your bedside right before you tap out? Mm-hmm. And why do they show up? And what do they talk about? Mm-hmm. And what do you think about? Mm -hmm. right? I got plenty of money. I don't really give a shit. I I love money, right? Like I like nice cars and things, you know, I know you're not a car guy. I'm a car guy, but (laughs) it doesn't matter. 
right? Like what I really care about is who's going to show up at my bedside, you know, that, you know, that week before I tap out, assuming that's the way it goes down and I don't get like run over by a bus tomorrow or something. Um, and what will we talk about? Why would we talk about it? And what would be most significant to them? And what would be most significant to me? Wow. So that's block eight. So the question is, no, most people don't go through life with intention. Right. They go through life by accident. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I, I've, <laughs> I've never been that guy. Like I've certainly had my face smacked around um, literally and, and metaphorically. Um, and, you know, I, I think that if you go through life with intention and you really think deliberately about where you want to go, uh, it will be so much better and so much more enjoyable. So I wanted to build a method for people to actually do that because no one teaches you. Like no one says, okay, today class in your sixth grade class, here's how we're going to learn to find out what your craft is, why you were put on this earth. Like that happens in no school ever. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's not society's fault that we live in like this world where it's, we, we just are so easily detached and disassociated with what you call intention. And you're right. There is no blueprint for that. And, um, being able to follow a type of framework, um, is phenomenal. So how does somebody get in touch with you? How do you, how do you like learn more about, about the eight block method? So, um, so the short answer is you can go to eightblockmethod.com. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of like a soft launch. I'm not really promoting it a ton. I'm just promoting it organically. I'm not doing any paid search or paid, uh, social ads yet. Uh, and, but we're probably less than a month away from like hard launch and putting some ad dollars behind it. Uh, but if you, so one thing you could do is you could just follow me on Instagram at lot, John, L O T T J O H N on Instagram, or you can go to my, a black method.com. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of doing a real deep dive now for a plug. For, I get no compensation for this or whatever. I just think he's interesting is Russell Brunson. I've read a lot of Hermosi stuff for guys that are fans of Hermosi. Uh, but I'm, I'm doing a real deep dive now on the Russell Brunson click funnel kind of. That's, a, that's a deep, ra- that's a deep rabbit hole, bro. It is. And, I'm, <laughs> I, and you know me, like I'm obsessive compulsive. Yeah. It, 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 so it's dangerous. Like it is. You're yeah, knowing, you're I am in a community. deep in the rabbit hole right now. Yeah, <laughs> you're in the communities and the. It's like this thing. big up there, I right? Know. Like I know. <laughs> you're in the funnel, learning about the funnel. 100 percent. Right. 100. You're but, in like th- you're in four different funnels right now. Yeah, I I am, and <laughs> uh, but you know I'm having fun, like totally, and, and like so tie this back to capital stack and and um and entrepreneurship or investing in companies. Like if you're an investor and you don't have an entrepreneur who's a complete nut job and willing to like go crazy hard on whatever, like that's what you're looking for. You're looking for someone who just has such deep commitment and they have insight to figure out like all the weird shit that's going to happen to them. They can figure it out. Mm -hmm. And if you're the entrepreneur, like if you don't care deeply If you're like in it for the money, like I never understood this when I was younger about why people would say, if you're in it for the money, you're really not going to be successful. But I understand it profoundly now because what happens is entrepreneurship is hard and it throws road. I I had this post I did the other day, which is a business is a million reasons to quit. Mm -hmm. And an entrepreneur is a million answers. Yeah. There's always That's a, really yeah. what it is at its core, at its essence. Um, you know, I think uh, I, I think that's super true. And I, I think people should really focus on finding something they're truly passionate about, because that is what's going to sustain you when the inevitable You know, the Mike Tyson, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. I love that saying. Mm -hmm. And it's true. I mean, 
you know, everyone does have a plan until they get punched in the face. I mean, you, there, there's no improving on that comment by Mike Tyson. It is just perfect for entrepreneurship. Well, and, and if you're an entrepreneur, I mean, like Ben Horowitz said, it's there's always a move to make. Yep. You know? Absolutely. I mean, there's always a move, right? And if when, once you think you're fucked, you're not really fucked. You're, you're, that's when you're, that's when your job starts. Yep. <laughs> yeah. John, thank you so much for coming on. Everybody, thank you for listening to another episode of The Capital Stack, where we talk to all these wonderful people about value creation. If you like it, please subscribe, tell a friend, and leave a review, because it really helps me out. And we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to The Capital Stack Podcast. Make sure to share this with someone you know that can benefit from this content. Remember to support this show by rating, reviewing, and subscribing. David Paul is the founder and general partner at DWP Capital. All opinions expressed by David and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of DWP Capital. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. David and guests may maintain positions in the securities discussed on this podcast.